Good morning and thank you for joining us for Mercy Vineyard Online. Hey, friendships are fabulous, aren't they? We all need a good friend, someone who listens to us, someone who get, lends a helping hand, someone who helps to propel you into your purpose, someone who looks out for you, right? Friends should be helpful and supportive, right? Not negative and dragging you down. Friends are people who you invest your time in and they invest time in you. People you invest energy into and they invest energy right back into you. You know, friends are people who you allow to see the good, the bad, and the ugly of your life, right? Because you trust them. Friends are people who you are honest with. Have you ever allowed someone to get so close to you and because you trusted them so you got so close that you allowed them to know your secrets? That's a friend. Someone who was so close to you that you, you, you even gave them a door key to your house or your apartment? That's close. That's friendship, right? You trust that person. You let them close to your family and meet your family. Let them get to know you and your family. Maybe you got, you let them, you trusted them so much that you let them get to know your, your significant other or, uh, 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 or you just trust them with your life. The best thing that you can have in this life is a friend like Jesus, who you can trust with everything. And the best thing that you can be in this life is to be a friend like Jesus, who is trustworthy. It is through those profound uh, relationships, friendships, that both parties are formed for their future. All of this is good and we want more of it, don't we? We want friends, I want friends. We want people to invest in us and that we can invest in. We want a best buddy, right? But if we're honest, we're honest with ourselves today, we know that the deeper our friendships, the greater the risk of profound pain. Every time you open yourself up, uh, uh, you put yourself in a vulnerable place, don't you? To being hurt by the person that you let in that close. Hurt by you. Have you ever been hurt by your honey? Have you ever been uh, betrayed by your buddy? Have you ever been attacked by your amigo? Or has your advocate ever become your adversary? Have you ever had a friend to become your villain? Ooh, as we continue this series called Redeemed Villains. Uh, this is actually the last message in the series. So, so I hope you've checked out the whole series. Uh, it's been a really fun series. Uh, I really enjoy these character studies. But as we finish up this series, would you take a moment and follow me to Luke chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. I'll be reading from the NIV and it'll be on the screen. It reads, one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. You see, before Jesus chose his 12 friends, right? His small group, his closest companions, his buddies, he had a conversation with God. When was the last time that you consulted God, the Father, before making a life impacting choice like choosing a mate or a companion or choosing a, the right small group or, 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 or choosing the right best friend or choosing the neighborhood that you move into. You see, God always has something to say about who we surround ourselves with because it's vital, right? We don't want to surround ourselves with the wrong people and they lead to our demise, right? God wants us to spend time with people who are going to invest time in us as well. And that's important because time is a resource that you can never get back. You see, Jesus Christ had an unmediated connection with God the Father. And his Father in heaven directed him to choose the following team. Maybe you've heard these names before. Verse number 14 says that he chose Simon, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, the son of uh, uh, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. 
Judas, you telling me that I can pray all night long? God send me my right friends. God send me the people you want me to hang around to spend the rest of my life with. And you send me all these great guys, maybe. And Judas, let's talk about this dude, right? How many of you out there are expecting children? You, you, you might be pregnant. You're going to adopt somebody, right? Right. How many of you are planning to name your child Judas? No, I, I don't see any hands. Or maybe because I'm talking to a camera right now. Uh, how many of you have been to a baby shower for a Judas? A, a, a gender reveal party for Judas? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, uh, you don't see many Judases anymore. <laughs> Let's do a character study on this man, Judas, and find out why. Uh, Judas, first of all, was someone's son. We find in John chapter 6, verse number 71, that he was the son of Simon Iscariot. Now, the word Iscariot is not a last name. It's not like Gary Dawkins, right? Iscariot is a compound word. It's Ishkarioth. It's, it's the word Ish in Hebrew means Adam or man. And Karioth was thought to be a city that was south of Jerusalem. So it's the, the man, Judas the man from the city of, of Karioth. Now, in Mark chapter 3, verse 19, Judas was chosen by Jesus, right? He didn't come against his will. He wasn't forced. Jesus went and chose him like he chose the other 12 and said, follow me. Now, we're not made aware of Judas's profession. Like, was he a fisherman? We don't know. Was he a tax collector like Matthew? We don't know. That's not in the scriptures. But we do know that Jesus put him in charge of the small group's treasury. He was responsible for the offering box. And John chapter 12, verse number six tells us that. And he used to, it also tells us that he used to help himself to the contents. Every time, we don't know why, right? Uh, listen, I like to humanize people. There's a whole lot of people like to demonize other human beings, but here is another human being, Judas, and we don't have any evidence of his background or his socioeconomic status, so we don't know why he would help himself. Maybe he was experiencing extreme poverty. Maybe he had a bill that he needed to pay off. Maybe his mom was sick, and following Jesus is not a paying job. We don't know why he would help himself to the treasury. He also chose to follow Jesus. Not only did Jesus choose him and say, follow me, but he had to make that decision in that moment to leave behind whatever he was doing and follow Jesus. And he did for a period of three years. He learned under Jesus. What a great education. What a great discipleship he experienced following Jesus. Now, Luke chapter nine, verse number one says he gave them, Jesus did, he gave Judas power and authority to drive out demons and to cure diseases. Man, Judas was out here in these streets making a difference for the kingdom of God, man. And he's, watch this, verse number two says, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Man, there was some power running through this man, Judas. Now, we all know <clears throat> Judas' crime. We know why people don't name their kid Judas because of his betrayal of Jesus. But do you know his breaking point? Was he always a bad guy? John chapter 12, verse number four says, when a woman came uh, uh, and, and the, the, uh, uh, the disciples were reclining at a table, she came in the room with a jar, alabaster jar of perfume, and she broke it over Jesus's head and anointed him with this wonderful smelling perfume. In that instance, Judas thought, and he actually said, this should have been sold. That's a whole lot of money in this. Uh, scholars say that it's probably a year's worth of wages to buy this jar and perfume. That's a lot of money. And so we could have sold it, and he said we could have gave it to the poor. 
That's one reason I say maybe Judas was poor because uh, he was going to be the one taking that money. Uh, he was going to help himself to it. Uh, uh, but that was a breaking point for Jesus because now he's arguing with Jesus. Read it for yourself, John chapter 12. He's, he's in a conflict now because uh, uh, that money, that, uh, because, you know, many of our relationships break up because of money. Uh, he would have been responsible for selling that perfume and putting the money in the treasury and then probably helping himself to it. And so now he sees this event as harmful to himself. This is when Judas walks away. And when he walks away, he goes and has a conversation with the chief priests who were already after Jesus' neck. Judas attempted to make a new friend group with the wrong crowd. Be careful who you confide in when you are upset. You don't know that group and you don't know their intentions. And if you open yourself up too quickly to a new group of people, you don't know what they will do with this information. Judas then sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. Now, if we go back in the Old Testament and look at prophecy, uh, this was a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Uh, God always knew that this was happening. This is not a surprise. Zechariah chapter 11, verse 12 tells us about that. And then we see the end of Judas' story. Matthew chapter 27, verses 3 and 4 read, When Judas, who had betrayed himself, excuse me, who had betrayed him, talking about Jesus, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us? They replied. That's your responsibility. Let's break this passage down. Judas came to his senses when he saw that, they, uh, that things had gone too far. When he sold Jesus out, they arrested Jesus and they flogged him, meaning they beat him uh, uh, almost to death. They say he had beat him till he was unrecognizable. And when Judas saw what they had done to Jesus, when, they saw, when he saw that they had condemned him, he felt remorse. You see, he came to his senses, uh, 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 and, and, and what does he do? He goes to the priests, which was the custom at that time, and confesses his sin. Look at what he says. He said, for I have betrayed innocent blood to the priests, which is a fulfillment of pro prophecy again. It's a fulfillment of the Deuteronomy prophetic curse that says, uh, uh, cursed is anyone who accepts a bribe to kill an innocent person. That's Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 25. All of this is biblical prophecy coming to pass. Judas attempts to repent for his sins because he is feeling remorseful. The Greek word that Matthew uses here for repent or remorse is, uh, uh, well, I'm not going to attempt to uh, mention the Greek word. Uh, you can look it up for yourself. Uh, but what it means is that one has a change of heart or a change of emotions. So he returns the money. He actually throws the money at the feet of the priest. And that is symbolic that one is washing their hands of this, that I am no longer involved. He returned the money, right? And his return of the money was also an attempt for him to stop the proceedings. It's like, okay, that's enough. I hung out with this guy. This guy gave me power to heal people. This guy gave me authority to go and preach. This guy invested in me for three years, and I, now I see what y'all did to the guy who loved on me and cared for me for three years. Uh, here's the money back. Stop this right now. And the chief priests, of course, didn't listen because they were looking for their agenda to be fulfilled. Finally, this is a little trigger warning uh, about suicide. Judas sacrificed himself. Why did he do that? He did that because the chief priests in this passage incorrectly informed him that he had to pay for his own sin, that it was his responsibility. 
Watch this. It, it, the chief's priest's job was to sacrifice for the people's sins. When a person came to confess their sin, it's the priest's responsibility to sacrifice for that sin, to offer a sacrifice for the people. And they did not do that. Listen, if you're watching today, and maybe you're struggling with life. Maybe everything in life just feels overwhelming or really hard right now. Maybe you're having unpleasant thoughts about even harming yourself. Listen, I care about you. And there's someone out there who cares about you. Will you take a moment and just text or call this number right here. It's 988. You can call from your mobile device or even text that number and let them know, hey, I'm having these thoughts or I'm having these feelings because there's someone on that other line who cares about you and would love to hear your story and what you're going through. That is the suicide prevention hotline. So if you're going through something right now, there are people who care and there are people who love you and want to see the best for you. Back to Judas. Judas was Jesus' friend. He was Jesus' friend who made a mistake and betrayed him. And he had eventually a change of heart. How did Jesus treat the friend who became eventually his enemy? And what should we do <laughs> as New Testament believers, followers of Jesus? I, I, you know, what should we do? When friendships go wrong, I'm going to tell you a couple things that Jesus did. First of all, love them. Jesus loved Jesus publicly and privately. According to Mark chapter 14, Luke chapter 22, and John chapter 13, Jesus loved Judas so well that the other disciples had no clue who the betrayer was going to be. They were asking Jesus, is it going to be me? Because, like, it seemed like you love all of us. You treat us all so well. Jesus shows us that if you are walking with him, then no one should know who your enemies are. Ooh, that's, I stepped on somebody's toes. I stepped on my own. Why? Why? Because even if you don't like a person, Christians, followers of Jesus, should treat their enemies with dignity and respect. Period. Luke chapter 6. Verse 27 says this, but to you who are listening, I say, this is Jesus talking, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. Ooh, Jesus never said Christianity was easy. We shouldn't be the ones who participate in ghosting or canceling one another. Uh, that's not the character of Christ. Jesus never said, that following him would be easy, but with the Holy Spirit, all things are possible. What's some other things that Jesus shows us uh, 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 that he did for Judas and he did for his own enemies? Uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 44 tells us that he prayed for them. Uh, let me read it to you. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. As followers of Jesus, we have to learn to trust the Lord's plan, right? That he can deal with your enemies way better than you ever could. Finally, Jesus says, be kind to them. Let me go back to an Old Testament scripture that Jesus repeats in the New Testament. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 21 says, if your enemy is hungry, give them food to eat. If he's thirsty, Give him water to drink. What? <laughs> In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head and the Lord will reward you. You looking for some reward, some joy, some, some everything from the Lord? Treat your enemy well. Romans chapter 12, verse 19 says, Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. You see, a lot of us in our current culture, we think we have to get back at people when they do wrong to us. But Jesus says, let me do that. I can handle your enemy far better than you can. Trust God because he can do some amazing and miraculous things. 
So let us be careful of how we treat our friends who may do us wrong, our friends who may make a mistake, our friends who may betray us, because God has a way of using what your enemy meant for evil and turning it around for your greater good. Today, uh, many of us still despise Jesus. The more I, uh, I mean Judas, I'm sorry, don't despise Jesus. A lot of us despise Judas because the more I read, I'm reading these commentaries and uh, checking out what other pastors are saying about these passages, of scriptures, and I'm, I'm just uh, uh, um, shocked, right? The more I study this man, the more I find other people have a visceral response to him. They actually, there are really writers and theologians that hate this man. I thought we weren't supposed to hate. I thought we weren't supposed to judge. I thought that that was God's responsibility. Many writers condemn him to hell and they say that he abandoned the faith. But no one knows what that man had to say to God before he met his demise. You don't know the conversations that people are having with God. So please don't judge other people. Last I checked, Jesus was best at buzzer beaters. Jesus was best at fourth quarter comebacks. You see, because on that same day that he was betrayed and flogged and, and, and Judas sold him out and even Judas felt remorse on that same day, Jesus was hung on a cross right next to two thieves. And one of those thieves leaned over and said, Jesus, when you get to your kingdom, can you remember me? Jesus stopped dying and said, today you will be with me in paradise. And that is the spirit of the Jesus that I follow. Jesus who loves all people and there is no villain too far for Jesus to reach. Jesus was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. That is Isaiah chapter 53, verse number five. You see, there is no one that's too far from Jesus because his love lasts forever. But without Judas, there would have been no arrest of Jesus. Without the betrayal of a friend, there would have been no sellout, no verdict from the leaders of the Jewish temple, no penalty given by Pontius Pilate, no flogging, no crucifixion, and therefore there would have been no resurrection. You see, God has a way of using what your enemy designed for your destruction to turn it around for your greater good. Listen, be patient with God. God can use anything to propel you into your purpose. Just look at Jesus' example. You see, my God, he specializes in turning death into life, bad into good, sickness into health, poverty into wealth, hate into love, and bondage into freedom. The Apostle Paul was right when he said this in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, that all things... The good, the bad, the ugly, the in-between, all things work together for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. So, my friends, will you take a next step with me so that Jesus can bless your life this week? Watch this. Identify one person who has betrayed you, who has done you wrong, who you don't see eye to eye. And I'm going to ask you this. Will you pray for that person? every day this week. For the next seven days, write that person's name down on a piece of paper and stick it in your pocket and keep it with you or or put it on a note in your phone. And every time you open your phone, you see that person's name and you say, oh, you may say, oh, right. But I want your heart and your mind to connect when you see that name and say, I'm going to pray for that person. Because when you do, watch God either change that person or change your heart for them. God can do the miraculous if we truly trust and believe. Thank you for listening. Father, we thank you so much for your words. We thank you so much for the character that is Judas. And we pray that we can learn something, uh, even from the hard things in the scriptures. God, would you uh, uh, save our souls and save our lives? And if we're going through uh, uh, troubles and having thoughts of harming ourselves, God, would you meet us right where we are right now? Would you let us know that you love us and that there are people who love us right here and direct us to the help that we need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Blessings to you. Have a wonderful, productive, 
week.